Hello, hello. It's working, very good. <laughs> hello, hello.
Hello, everybody. It's 3 p.m. We will wait two more minutes for people to arrive. Just I would like to appreciate the fact that you came in time. And we are looking forward to some more to come probably uh, in the next two minutes. And then we will take off. If you stay until the end and you don't snore too loudly, I may give you some presents. So hello everybody, uh, welcome to the session on measuring and assessing the impact of scouting. Is the microphone okay? Everybody can hear? Everybody can hear well? So I would like to uh, welcome all of you on site and I would like to uh, welcome uh, our brothers and sisters who are probably behind the camera somewhere around the world. For them a note, the presentation that we will be using um, in the panel discussion has been uploaded to the website, so you can get it from there. And apart from you guys over here and those guys over there, I would like to say hello to Bonnie and Philip, our OCLs, who will be helping us with the interaction with the online uh, scouting community around the world. So hello, everybody, and have a good afternoon. We are aware of the fact that uh, we do have a very diverse and very experienced group of participants here. So it's not only the gentlemen in the panel uh, that will be uh, giving uh, input in the beginning, but we've got a lot of experience around the room. We want to build on that. Uh, that's why you might have read on the website that this is a panel discussion with a uh, part, uh, part input uh, in the form of a workshop. So it's not only about listening or about listening and asking questions, uh, but since the Congress is about the future of world scouting and about the future of the world organization of the scout movement, so we want to have some inputs for, uh, for the World Scout Committee and for the world organization, what we expect um, as a movement when it comes to assessing the impact, what kind of tool we, wa we might want to have. So what are we going to do here today? Uh, a few uh, housekeeping announcements. So uh, we will have time for questions and answers. 
we are live streamed. We've done that already. If you've got very nice uh, calling tones on your cell phones, please uh, turn them off for the moment. I mean, not the cell phones, but the calling tones. And so that we don't disturb each other. And here we go to the presentation of our speakers. We've got a panel discussion with three distinguished gentlemen. Uh, first of them is Dr. Wayne Adrian Davis, a uh, member of the Africa Scout Committee and Chief Commissioner of the Ethiopia Scout Association. Hello, Davis. And then you sit down again, and yeah. then I will speak. Uh, I will still introduce the other guys. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. And we have not practiced this quite in detail, so now we've got Mr. Jonathan Amondi. Uh, the Youth Program Coordinator of the Africa Regional Office. Hello, Jonathan. And last but not least, we've got uh, Mr. Malcolm Tan, uh, the Chairman of Management Subcommittee of Asia Pacific Region and National Program Commissioner of the Singapore Scout Association. Hello, Malcolm. My name is Permi, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this session. So I'm happy to be here with these gentlemen and with all of you. So the topic of uh, impact, uh, the topic of assessment of impact, or the topic of measurement of impact of scouting has been around for a lot of time. Um, we know a lot of things about scouting. We know that we've been around for quite some time and that we are many. We know that, we know that well and we know that we've got many uh, millions of young people around the world that we take care of and that we offer them opportunity for growth uh, together with them. We know that what we want to achieve, which is creating a better world, is not something that we do at once and that we try to influence, that we try to help grow the young people. And through the personalities of young people that grow through scouting, we are trying to reach uh, the better world. So that's the things that we know for sure. But very often, when it comes to explaining to others what we really do, what we really achieve, and how it impacts the societies we live in, uh, where we are active, and the young people that are active in scouting, we come up with some things that are very interesting and are very true, but very often they turn to cliches. We talk about important people that have been through scouting and that say I have I was a scout as a kid and it gave me a lot it is definitely true in case of millions of people and uh, definitely thousands of very famous people around the world but maybe it's not telling enough about what we do as scouts we often talk about when there is a uh, natural disaster uh, like the one recently um, in the Philippines about the offer that scouts, local scouts offer to the communities uh, to help, which is something that is very visible and it is an outcome of our education, but still we are not a relief organization, so it's just a fragment of what we are supposed to do um, to the world and young people. And what we will try to address here today uh, from several viewpoints with your help is to see whether we know what kind of impact we have, whether somebody, some of the NSOs know what kind of impact they have on their young people and on their societies, and have a look at whether the world scouting can help us in NSOs develop tools or generally encourage us to be better at assessing the impact and then maybe as well communicating the impact towards uh, the people that might be interested, be it parents, be it media, be it teachers. Some of the keywords that will be uh, addressed today uh, by, by the panel, uh, you, can see, you can see on the screen. So we'll be talking a bit about definitions, but we'll be talking very much as well about uh, whether we know what, what's happening, whether we do have some numbers uh, when it comes to impact. And we'll be talking about examples from within the world of scouting and from beyond the world of scouting. And we'll be talking about going forward as well. So what we as individuals might be doing and what the world of scouting might be doing in order uh, to help us get better in the area of impact assessment and measurement of impact of scouting in general. And now 
uh, after the short introduction, uh, please allow me uh, to invite on the stage uh, Davis. Uh, I think it's time for you really to come, Davis, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I love the mic or something because I, I knew that I was supposed to come at this point, but my body got up and started walking. I guess that's the impact it has on me when it comes to scouting. Uh, as Permi mentioned, it is really hard to talk to people, basic things, who've been in the business for over 100 years. However, we said, let's take the risk of going really basic so that the panel, through discussion, we go uh, up and further. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was, are we talking about the same business? What is impact assessment in its general sense, in the NGO world, in uh, social um, activities, in, in social organizations, in, 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 in what we do in scouting? So impact assessment is basically a process. It is not just a final result. It's not an end result, but a process of identifying what we want to achieve and, of course, planning and working on how to get there. So according to this definition that we have, the interventions in the social, economic, environmental factors that the in intervention is designed to affect, and not just the planned uh, effect, but also the unplanned one. Uh, impact basically is a long-term and sustainable change. If it is a medium, a short, we have other terms for it. But if it is an income, it is a long term. And when it comes to scouting, we've been doing scouting. We've been doing this work. We've been doing uh, impact assessment and everything. But sometimes it becomes like the weather. Everybody knows about it. Everybody talks about it. But nobody does anything about it. So this is the point when we said, let us talk about impact assessment. Let us talk about measuring the actual impact that we're, we're making into this. Then, of course, we said uh, the anticipated effects, but also can be unanticipated. And it is usually hoped to be positive, and sometimes it can be negative. Then also, we have impact as being an integral part of planning. You cannot have impact assessment without planning. And at NSO level, at local level, when we talk about this, we have a major problem. At least the region that I come from, we have a major problem. We don't plan. We plan always at NSO level. We plan at regional. We don't plan at local level. And without planning, you cannot really assess your actual impact. Uh, we have the two levels of uh, impact assessment. One is the internal, which is the monitoring and evaluation within the organization. And the second one is the external, which is done by usually professionals that come from the outside do uh, the assessment. We're uh, doing with the SGS and uh, other organizations as well. Then we have the various methodologies uh, of impact assessment. We have uh, the quantitative, uh, which is you make your uh, baseline where you are, then where you want to go. go. You have a rigorous research, rigorous follow-up, rigorous uh, work on, on in terms of assessment of your impact and the change that you want to see. Then you have the qualitative, which is more complex than it is in, in terms of uh, the participatory or, or even the quantitative, because the quantitative usually depends on data, whereas the qualitative has its secondary data and uh, various other approaches. Then also you have my favorite and the one we usually utilize in scouting the participatory approach, which is the, the stakeholders, the people who are within that activity, within that movement, within that action, take part in uh, the, the uh, assessment of that effect or the impact that they're uh, making. Uh, earlier it was mentioned, we have output, outcome, and impact. These are very similar and many people put them as short term, medium term, and long term. But they go a bit farther, even on what you are measuring, how you are measuring, they go a, a bit uh, wider than that. Output, very easy, straightforward, is 
what you want to see as a result, as an immediate result of what you're doing. Then where it comes to output, it is a bit more complicated. Yesterday, uh, when Chris uh, Lonsdale was talking about parents being the bowman and children being the arrows, it is about that, the outcome of your upbringing of your child, the way you raise your child, the way you teach, the way we do it in scouting, the way we instill these values is more into the outcome. Because if we get the target, if we get the results that we expect, then we have gotten the target right. The outcomes are uh, positive, as we put it. Then the final one, which is the impact. The impact is a very more uh, or a much more complex than an outcome or the output because it is not directly correlated to the action. It is what effect the action can have even way after that action has stopped. For this, the, the great uh, examples Permi gave were like the astronauts we have. They were scouts at one point, they moved into a different world, then they succeeded, they made it. So is it the, 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 the impact of scouting on them that, that really led them into that? We can't tell, but we just hope. And we, we usually, um, I love taking that credit as a scout. I say like, you know, we have presidents, we have leaders, we have this in scouting because of the basic values that we have put. But if you come to argument, if you come into like a proper breaking down of facts, it becomes very difficult to trace why that impact has, has, uh, what that impact has happened because it has already left your territory. It has already gone. It is, the, the, the result has already gone there and beyond the result. What has happened beyond the outcome is the impact that we talk about. Uh, we have here the point of measurement at short distance or while the, the, the project or while the activity is being undertaken, you have output. We measure effort and of course the indicators how we are implementing the activity, how we are doing what you're doing or what we are doing. The next one is the outcomes. How effective are we in what we do? How uh, in line are we to you know, address the issue that we wanted to address in the beginning? Be it a social, uh, economical issue, be it an environmental issue, whatever issue it is, are we on that way? Are we on our way? Then the final is the change. When the change is made, hopefully for the better, hopefully positive, then we have made that impact. An absolute change from its original status, from the original uh, situation. This is um, a UN model that they use as um, impact assessment. They have three questions. How, what do we want, and why? You start how. Of course, you have your inputs, your activities. What do we want? The outputs, then progressively the outcomes, and the impact. And why do we want that? Then you have the resources. The resource level usually is in the input and in the activities. Then the results begin from outcome, and they continue with impact. So you have these two things. Planning, assessment, all together through the life of the implementation and beyond the implementation of the activity. In scouting, we have a model that, that's being used. I know there are several other models that uh, we have as well, but this was the one uh, which we could access. And it is about conducting the personal evaluation and unit assessment when you start developing the activities, theme proposals, and etc. Then that develops into the processing, which we said earlier. You start your work, you see how it, it's going, then you prepare your activities, you finish your activity, then you evaluate and you see how that activity has made a progress. You monitor how it has made an impact. So. These are the things I just want to talk about, but my brother, uh, Jonathan, I'm sure will elaborate on this, and uh, I'll give it to Permi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Davis.
So now we've got a basic understanding of uh, about uh, impact assessment. Uh, what Jonathan now will be talking about is uh, the issues that might come up uh, when we focus on impact assessment and how to overcome them. And I would like to thank Davis because he almost managed to stay in time that was planned. So this was unexpected. So and we'll be uh, so we'll be trying to. I, I need to compliment him now because the others are motivated now to do that as well. So and now the floor is yours, Jonathan. Thank you, Pami. When NSOs plan, or when any organization plans, they, there are four fundamental questions they ask themselves. One of them is normally finding out where we are. Next is where we want to be. Then, how do we get there? But one question that is rarely answered is how do we know when we get there? So impact assessment, in a way, helps in answering the, that question. How do we know when we get there? And like any other process, like any other journey, it's normally have, it normally has its own challenges. So I'll just be exploring some of these challenges. These are just few challenges, not all the challenges that you may encounter, especially in social impact assessment, but just some of the challenges and also some of the ways in which these challenges could be addressed. One of the challenges that uh, most organizations will encounter is a clear program and process design. W when you set out to do impact assessment, it has to be really got right from the beginning that what was the program and what is the need that you want to address so that the process uh, is understood by all the stakeholders from the beginning. Be clear that whatever program you're evaluating or whatever program you are, whose impact you're assessing, is clearly understood and everyone understands why you're doing that. So in most cases you find uh, it's normally just done in an ad hoc way that we think, ah, let, let's find out uh, probably how many young people have had some positive impact from scouting without necessarily fitting it within a global context of a program. The other aspect of a challenge will be the issue of power control and ownership. The question of whose agenda is it? When you set out to do impact assessment, there are normally different stakeholders who have different levels of interest, but also different powers of influencing uh, whatever results of impact assessment. So you find that due to the different stakeholders and their varied interests and needs, the, it, it, it in most cases influences the way the process is, take, is carried out and uh, also influences the objectivity. So that, again, is something to look at in terms of uh, how would you address the interest of all the stakeholders? I think one of the challenges, one of the big challenges with social impact assessment is that you are setting out to measure complex and intangible change. Uh, it's not just limiting your assessment to quantitative issues, but also qualitative, things you cannot touch. And uh, within scouting, we fall under that because we are trying to measure social impact, something you cannot put your hand in that uh, uh, scouting contributed to change of this particular behavior. So I think it's, it's a challenge that need, we grapple with and also needs to be addressed. Related to the same is the issue of uh, demonstrating causality and attribution. Sometimes, for example, when I say uh, that... Uh, I, 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 I attribute the, what has happened in my life to scouting. That it's because of scouting that I'm here today and that I, I am who I am. Normally the risk is that when you want to attribute any impact, it simply means you have to eliminate all the other possible causes. That if, if you turn out to be the, one, the person you are because of scouting, it simply means also that Within a scientific field, you need to prove that all the other causes have been eliminated. So a, a simple way of dealing with this in uh, social impact will be, rather than attributing, you just say that, you, you focus on the contributory aspects, that uh, one of the reasons that 
this change has been realized is that scouting just contributed, not really that you attribute everything to that change. Another element is the issue of challenge of responding to the context and culture. When you, when you set out to carry out impact assessment, all these processes and activities need to be based on the context. What works in uh, one part does not necessarily mean that it will work in another part. So setting out the context means you need to understand uh, the different stakeholders, their belief systems, their values, so that when you set out the impact assessment exercise, then it will be based on local realities. So it's not like you'll say that one size fits all. Uh, one thing with impact assessment is that it's a costly exercise. So the, the, there's also the challenge of committing to the investment costs. Do you just want to do it for the sake of it, or is there any value addition? So an organization needs to commit to impact assessment so that you don't end up doing something shoddy. Because again, one thing with the impact assessment is uh, the key issues you want to achieve is the issue of credibility, validity, and also reliability that whatever results you uh, put out can really be valid and uh, can really be acceptable across the board. Those are just some of the challenges, not all of them, but just a few of the challenges. But also, these are some of the ways in which we can overcome these challenges. Uh, one of them will be through stakeholder involvement and prioritization. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things you'll find out is there are different stakeholders. There are many stakeholders. So one of the key things for us to do as an NSOs is to do a stakeholder analysis. Who are our stakeholders? What are their level of uh, influence? What are their level of interests? So if we have that stakeholder analysis, because one of the things that will always happen is that uh, when you initiate the process of impact assessment, there are those who will be for the idea, there are those who will be against the idea, and there are those also who are hard to deal with, the people called the don't cares. So it's always important to know who your stakeholders is and prioritize uh, their involvement. Then there's the issue of self-assessment. Uh, for an organization, uh, they need to take that self-retrospection, and uh, self-assessment means that you initiate that impact assessment process from within. That we say that as an organization, we really want to evaluate our impact, rather than saying that, uh, rather than having it like something external, but make a commitment from within that you let's evaluate our impact. The other element is uh, the element of triangulation. Uh, for those in research who have done research methods, uh, this is a common component that for you to ensure there's some validity and reliability, you need to use different methods, different methodologies, but also involve different groups so that whatever data you end up with will have been collected from different methodologies and also you will have involved different groups so that you have a, that chance of having more valid data. Uh, those who are in the morning remember the, the seven simple rules. So one of the things to do is also to keep it simple and systematic. systemic. Simple is nice. Uh, uh, for example, as a youth organization, let's just have simple categories or criteria for what we want to assess in terms of impact, but also let it be systemic. That uh, think strategically, impact assessment should be broad-based, so that you, you don't do, just do things sporadically or in an ad, ad, ad hoc way, but you plan in a long-term way, so that whatever impact assessment you carry fits in within a long-term plan of, of, of the organization. Then there's also the need of balancing the different methods and tools. Uh, a balance also helps in yielding uh, better results, more credible results, and also uh, ensuring that there's many uh, stakeholders who participate. So in spite of all the challenges uh, that we highlighted, one thing that comes out is that for us as a social movement, uh, we, we want some social impact. 
impact assessment will be good for us as a scout movement so that we can be able to assess. Uh, it's hard because we deal with the humans and you cannot really say that uh, I, I trace this particular one young person who comes into scouting throughout their life in scouting. But it's, it's important for us as a scout movement to position ourselves in a way that we can put the aspect of impact assessment within the organization so that in years to come, we can say and we can trace in a scientific way that we are creating this positive change. So in this journey, there will be challenges, but what is reassuring to us is once we do that impact assessment and we have the results, it helps positioning us in terms of shaping our movement for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So what we heard so far was from Davis talking about what impact assessment really is. Uh, from Jonathan, uh, what the obstacles are that we need to overcome if we want to be successful at impact assessment. And I, I would like to invite to the lectern Malcolm, who would give a few examples of uh, associations that have ma managed to measure their impact and how they did it and what outcomes they had. So Malcolm, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Burmi. Uh, I usually get the uh, worst lot. Uh, after my, I finish boring you to tears, we will have a short workshop where you will do all the work, and I think that's where the exciting bits are. But, uh, and I can assure you that I do not have nice uh, pictures and photographs, unlike my uh, colleagues. All I will have are numbers, numbers, and more numbers. So if you were not snoring before, you will start snoring very soon. Right. Uh, my session, is, uh, my little portion is about the empirical evidence of the benefits of scouting. Uh, I, and I will share with you, uh, well, three examples which I managed to get off, uh, which I managed to find. The first is this survey uh, done by the Boy Scouts of America in 2005 uh, called Values of Americans, a study of ethics and character. Now, I, am I will be sharing with you the methodology of, all of these three studies that I uh, have extracted just to share with you how difficult it is to actually measure the impact of scouting. Now, in this 2005 study, the data was, conduct data was collected be uh, over two months in 2004 using 1,524 telephone uh, surveys with adults and 1,714 in-school surveys with young people from 4th to through 12th grades. And these are some of the findings. I am only sharing uh, part, some of the findings with you. The report is about, it's about 70 or 80 pages. So one of the findings is that scouting has a positive effect on an individual's ability to work with others. 79% of all respondents agree. 77% of all respondents agreed that scouting helps an individual to accomplish self-imposed tasks, which means scouts, if they decide they want to do something, they will really do something, right? 76% 76% agree that scouts generally accomplish tasks set by others. So if you're an employer, uh, well, it will serve you well if you uh, employ scouts. Uh, and interestingly, the same conclusion was reached by in the United Kingdom, which I will be sharing with you later. 89% of all respondents strongly agree that scouting helps character development, and 86% strongly agree that scouting is beneficial to inner city youth. And this is relevant because in many of our societies, uh, young people tend to migrate to cities, and unfortunately, those who are not that well off tend to end up in inner city uh, suburbs and so on, so, uh, inner city, uh, well, ghetto, so to speak, and it's been shown, uh, and it's been shown from this study that scouting does help them quite a bit. Right on the scouting difference, how has scouting made different uh, a difference in the lives of people? Character development, as between a non-scout and scouts for and and scouts. Now, 96% of young people have been scouts for more than five years were good team players. 84% of scouts who have even in one scouts even for one year were good team players. On honesty, 96% of young pe of people who were scouts for more than 
five years were found to be honest, and so on and so forth. Uh, respect for life and property, if you are a property owner, well, 95% of, of scouts who were scouts for more than five years have respect for life and the property of others. On the issue of life skills, scouting has also made a positive difference. I've already shared some of those points with you earlier. Oh, and this is the one that will help you in recruitment. 91% of young people who have been scouts for more than five years graduate from high school. 87% of those who are scouts for even one year graduate from high school. 35% graduate from college. And household incomes are higher for scouts than for non-scouts. These are all empirical evidence from this study. It will, serve you, it will be useful for you to look up these studies. And these are statistics which you can actually use to influence parents and stakeholders to realize that scouting has a measurable impact on a young person's life, even in terms of dollars and cents. The next uh, study that I'll be sharing with you is this study called Eagle Scouts, Merit Beyond the Badge. Uh, it's a study by, from Baylor University, led by Professor Sung Jun Zhang in 2012. And you look at how e extensive this study is. A Gallup, uh, well, Gallup recruited potential respondents anonymously through random digit sampling. 81,409 potential respondents were contacted, probably through email, flyers, and so forth. Among those who agreed to be recontacted, 2,512 were randomly selected. So the sample is 2,512. The study is based by data from these 2,512 adult males. There's a margin of error of plus, minus four. Out of this 2,512, 134 were Eagle Scouts, 853 identified themselves as scouts and 1,502 were non-scouts. 23 of them could not be identified as either of the three because they couldn't make up their mind whether they were eager scouts, scouts or non-scouts. Uh, some people are just plain confused. Yeah. Sometimes I, I am too. Right, so this is uh, the outcome of the survey. Compared to non-scouts, eager scouts are apparently able to establish greater lifelong connections with family, friends and neighbours. Now, we talk about breakup of society. Society begins at home and society begins in your community. 46% of Eagle Scouts are more likely to say they talk to the neighbours at least once a month. They are 38% more likely than non-Scouts to indicate they are close to their siblings. And they are 37% more likely than non-Scouts to have extremely close friends. Well, they say no man is an island, but unfortunately, many people nowadays are islands in their own world. Uh, often, it's the virtual world. They talk to each other on the internet or play computer games. In Jap Japan, they have a term for it called otaku, yeah? Rico? So, uh, if you are a scout, you are not so likely to be an otaku. Compared to non-scouts, eager scouts generally exhibit a higher sense of responsibility to give back through volunteering and donation. They all, eager scouts are also more likely to develop a greater connection and concern for their community, and they are more likely the non-scouts to exercise more self-discipline to plan ahead and set and achieve goals. They also hold higher self-expectations and demonstrate greater appreciation and concern for the environment. 92, uh, Eagle Scouts are 92% more likely to be active in a group that works with the environment. They are 50% more likely to agree that they find a spiritual presence in nature. 42% more likely to visit a park and 31% more likely than non-scouts to avoid using products that harm the environment. Less eau de Cologne, perhaps. Right? Uh, and compared to non-scouts, Eagle Scouts are 45% more likely to treat people of other religions with respect. If you remember, at the plenary this morning, Dr. Amar had shared some ideas on how to get young people to respect each other. Well, if you are an Eagle Scout, appears to be more or less automatic. Uh, a similar study was conducted in the UK, and I think Craig will remember this, right? In 2012, uh, 
Again, look at the sample size, 2,500 people, 260 scout volunteers, 800 young people who are scouts, 600 former scouts, 100 people who are not scouts, and over 800 external organizations were interviewed. The study revealed that 91% of volunteers and 88% of young people stated that scouting had helped them develop key skills in life. 97% of volunteers and 92% of young persons in scouting stated that scouting had helped them with relationship building. Uh, again, uh, this is again quite useful. External organizations said that staff within their workplace who had been involved in scouting were above average employees across a wide range of attributes. Six out of ten employers said that scouts had developed good team working skills, scouts show respect for others, and this is important for working with peers, customers, and clients. Scouts, scouting had helped them build character and develop their personal personality, and the scouts showed, as compared to non-scouts, showed greater confidence and leadership ability. Again, we can use all these statistics to really show that scouting has made a real impact in someone's life. Uh, we know that impact assessment studies are essential for recruitment and stakeholder support. So it is important for scouting and for our national scout organizations, even all the way down to the local troop level, to measure how much scouting has impacted the young person. How do we do it? That is something for you afterwards, well, to think about. Thank you very much, Malcolm. So we now have started uh, the, the session with examples, with definitions, uh, with descriptions of what impact assessment is, how to overcome the connected challenges. And uh, Malcolm gave us uh, a few examples of US and UK studies from the Boy Scouts of America and from the Scout Association about what we can do, what kind of data we can gather if we have a look at, our, uh, at the people who have gone through scouting, if we have a look at them rather extensively, you have seen that it was not dozens of people who have been questioned, but in many cases it was hundreds or it went over 1,000. Uh, now I would like, uh, before we go uh, into the workshop for a bit, I would like to uh, give an opportunity for you to raise uh, a question to the, to the panelists or to raise a point of yourself. And before you make up your mind about what you want to ask or what you want to raise yourself, we've got a question to start with that came from, uh, from one of our online uh, followers. So uh, we had some questions ready and guys were ready for them and I will not ask, uh, start with those questions. So I hope you're happy. Uh, we've got a question from Martin Bjorgel. Uh, he might be in another session right now, or he might be in another continent. We will not know that, but we say hi. And uh, Martin's question is, what can be measured, and how can the impact of scouting be explained? So, anybody from the panelists would like to sh share his opinion on that? Very good, so we've got a mic over there. Okay, uh, first, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I mean, the first one, what can be measured, uh, work should be able to measure. If you don't measure, then you don't do, isn't it? Almost everything we do in this world is measurable in one way or the other. Of course, there are quantitative measure, measurable things, like in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, areas and all. Then you have the qualitative measurable things on how good it's done and how well it, it is going and all. And uh, the impact goes into either, either side. But when it comes to um, the second question, uh, the, the impact of scouting, I think what we've been doing for the past 100 years, and it is with great honor that I say what we have been doing for the past 100 years, is evident by itself that what we do is not just measurable, it is not just explainable, it is a reality. Uh, I had few conversations with people, how come we have not won Nobel Prize up to now? 
Is it because we're not marketing ourselves? Because I know we're doing great jobs. Whatever we're doing, we're doing great work at it. I am who I am today because of scouting and how many millions of people in this world can say. So the, the impact of scouting is definitely explainable. And um, I missed the, the, the exact wording. If you, if you say what can be measured and how can the impact be explained? Yes. So what can be measured? So the impact can be explained in terms of what is going on in today's world. Like we have uh, 30 million plus scouts around the world. And I think that explains itself. Uh, because sometimes we, we confuse, uh, especially at local levels, at NSO levels, we confuse two things. Uh, we measure our, imp like the first day I came here to Hong Kong, uh, I, know, I know the capacities and limitations of my NSO in Addis Ababa, and I was embarrassed. I said, oh my God, Ethiopia's cut a session. We have a one room, two rooms uh, office, and that is our NSO. And look at Hong Kong's cut a session. It is embarrassing. But th the bottom line is both NSOs are doing great work with the youth. And that should be an explanation enough, in my opinion. I hope I have answered, but Jonathan, maybe. So M Malcolm would like to say, or Jonathan would like to say? Malcolm, go ahead, please. Uh, what can be measured? I think the answer is quite simple. Anything can be measured. And how, do you, how can the impact of scouting be explained? It depends on how you frame the question. It has, if you remember the point raised by Dr. Thomas Chi this morning in response to Dr. Amel's, uh, Dr. Amel Musa's uh, talk, he said to keep it simple, scout. Now, anything can be measured. Uh, some of the figures I shared with you just now are things that are relevant to the young person for recruitment purposes, relevant for the purposes of selling scouting to our stakeholders. We can, of course, measure things like, now, how, to, uh, how much taller is a scout uh, in his first year as compared to the second year? You can measure that, but it is not anything useful. So what do we measure? It has to be relevant. And I think one other point I would like to raise is that we must be very, very careful that we do not get lost in, uh, chase, in the paper chase. We do not get lost in trying to fill up key performance indicators that are meaningless. Let me give you one example. And Craig, I'm so sorry, I have to talk about the UK, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, ah, you laugh, you know what I'm going to talk about. Yes, at Hume has a whole series of KPIs and performance indicators which was designed to improve the delivery of, of, health, uh, of healthcare. Unfortunately, many administrators in the National Health Service system ended up trying to fill up every single form, dot every T, cross every I, that they forgot about the patient. Right? A, in fact, just in April this year, there was a parliamentary inquiry uh, in, the, in the UK Parliament. And the Public Accounts Committee questioned the chief executive of, I think it was Lothian NHS. Now, they had one, uh, this, in this one particular key KPI they had was to respond to telephone calls for ambulances within 30 seconds. Apparently, they were unable to respond fast enough. So what they did was to send out instruction to all the telephone operators. If you can't do it, quickly shut it off and send it off to, to another service provider. Then it becomes their problem, it's not our problem. Unfortunately, what this means is that it will take even longer for the poor patient to get the ambulance. So your KPI is met because you meet every phone call, but if you can't meet a phone call, you quickly transfer it to someone else. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't get lost in collecting data, and thereby forgetting what we are supposed to do. Thank you very much, Malcolm. David has got an intervention. Um, I get this mic. David, would you be kind enough to walk over here so that Martin and everybody else behind the camera can watch you? And I'm happy. Yeah, the cross is yours. By the way, thank you, Malcolm. We have good examples of scouting results and uh, bad examples uh, when it comes so it was national health services so it's not in scouting that's good
David, the floor is yours. <laughs> I want to use the example of scouting. And I think that the simple measure is how many members do we have? But not just how many, what is our market share? I think that's the key element in terms of how we can measure the impact of scouting uh, on, on society. And I think that uh, speaking as a regional director and speaking as someone who believes in the power of scouting, I think that we can and we should be doing better. We might say we're doing very well and we're, we're making a huge impact in, in the lives of, of individuals. Wonderful. But we need to do it even more. We need to get more and more young people involved. Uh, that can be done as a percentage of the available youth population, or it can be, be, be done in terms of the, the real numbers. It doesn't matter. Uh, I think that uh, both measures at the moment are not good enough. That's my challenge as a, as a regional director, to motivate my region to try to, to improve. We have done. We have grown the numbers in Europe by half a million in the last 10 years. We have increased by something like uh, 30%. I hope we can continue to do that. But actually, if we're wanting to make a real impact, we need to have even more uh, members. Um, and I, I know that other regions have, have maybe more numbers, but it's the active engagement that I think we should be, we should be measured on. Thanks, Premier. Thank you very much, David. Feel free to come over here. Hello. Hello, yes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Patrick. I'm from Namibia, National Commis Commissioner for Adult Resources. Um, I'd just like to comment on the question of what can be measured. Stand here, am I, am I on camera? What can yeah. be measured? Um, last, what is last say name? Lars Kolindi from Denmark gave us a very inspirational um, uh, session this morning on, 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 on leadership. And to be very specific, he said 50% of the leaders, the world leaders, have had some sort of scouting experience. Uh, during their youth. Uh, but I think taking that and putting that into, into context, there is a challenge for the rovers and the youth as they go into university to start taking uh, research work in terms of how much, how much of their success in leadership has been influenced by the youth activities. I mean, at, at, at times, if we don't do it as, as scouts, nobody's going to do it for us. It, it, it needs us who, who were exposed in scouts, in, in, in scouting activities. Uh, as we go into university, I'm not a youth anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm just 41, so um, uh, for, for, as we go into university to start taking these challenges. Just to summarize, there are, sorry, uh, just to summarize, uh, one thing that really touches us in Southern Africa and very much so to the rest of the, wor in the, the world is the leadership, the amazing leadership skills of Nelson Mandela. Uh, Nelson Mandela never, was never a leader before he went to jail. He, never, he was never into a position where he could exercise leadership skills. But if you visit Robben Island you, 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 and you listen to all the stories, uh, he, he, he managed to even convince the, the, the criminals when, when, when the regime used to, 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 when they didn't want to go beat him up, they, took, they mixed him with the, with the criminals uh, to, to start beating. Um, but after five days, every after three days, he convinced all of them to be giving him newspapers and news. But those, those are the leadership skills that he gained most probably during the youth uh, uh, levels and activities. But all these things need needs to be researched and put into context. I've seen him yesterday, just in conclusion, putting on a scout uni uniform. But I mean, coming from Southern Africa, I feel ashamed that we have not taken these challenges to research and see, was he perhaps a scout? And, 
has that the skills that he learned during the scout movement, if he was, influenced his leadership capabilities and abilities. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, very much. Thank you for your comments. We have got now space for one more comment, question or intervention. Craig, please, would you like to do any of these? This cross is yours. Thank you, Permi. Uh, I think Malcolm is right. Um, there is a risk that we can drown in uh, KPIs and data and that we need to be smart about what it is that we want to uh, measure. And I think it's important to make a connection with the strategic objectives that associations have. And the, the reference that you made to the UK impact study is, is quite interesting. And one of the challenges that we face in the UK is, as many of your NSOs will also face, is the recruitment and retention of adult volunteers. And some of what we've undertaken in trying to understand the impact that scouting can have not just on young people, but on the adult volunteers, can help us to craft uh, approaches for trying to reach out and uh, recruit more adult volunteers by explaining uh, the benefits that scouting can have on them and through them the impact that they can have on young people. So I think it's really important to make a connection between uh, impact and strategy. But I think the challenge that uh, we've maybe not explored in detail uh, in this session is how how we actually go about doing that. If associations have maybe, maybe not got a culture of gathering data, modeling data, playing with data, interrogating it, making sense of it, what tools exist to help us do that? And there are some associations doing it and doing it well, and, there, and I think there are others who would want to but don't know where to start. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, very much. Thank you. And I said this would be the last question in this part, but we got another question from uh, from online community, and it relates a bit to well, it relates a lot to what David was saying earlier. And anybody might feel like answering. Uh, we've got a question from Claude Corbet. Uh, thank you for that question. Is there such a thing as a critical penetration rate in the youth population of a country? where scouting really starts to be a force in the community and make a difference. So, that, I think that's a good one. Um, so, do we have anybody in the room courageous enough to uh, try to answer a question like that? David is courageous enough. Very good. So, David, here you go. Baden Powell started with 20 boys. I think that that is the critical mass. A patrol is enough to begin to make an impact. It's like a drop. Uh, you, you've dropped the, pedal in, the pebble in and it, it, it uh, creates circles. I think that that's what we have to do. It doesn't matter how small that impact is it will eventually reach the edge. And therefore, I think that, that, uh, that it doesn't matter where we begin. It's what we're aiming for at the end. Thank you very much, David. I think Claude must be happy with the answer. So, uh, thank you very much for the, opening, uh, for the opening statements and for the opening interventions and questions from on-site and online community. And now we come to the part where we would like to offer you an opportunity uh, to um, have an active contribution to what will come up of this session and what kind of maybe directions uh, we could offer uh, to the World Organization when it comes to the area of impact assessment. Uh, I would like you now to, we will be working in groups, uh, we will be group, uh, working in groups of seven people and in those groups we'll be discussing and answering Two simple questions. So, if we could start by forming groups of seven uh, in any way that you find suitable. And one of the groups, we would like to come and be brave enough to sit here somewhere front so that even though uh, Claude and Martin and maybe some other people behind the camera will not hear what is being said in the groups, they still can see that there is something happening here. So, let's have groups of seven people and one of them uh, in the front over here. 
you, you'll be sitting on the stage. Have you sat on the stage over this weekend yet? So that's exciting. And, and, and very careful, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to do the guys careful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you were trying to be helpful, and this is the punishment <laughs> for that. So very good. It seems like we've we formed the groups. That's nice. Sorry. So, and uh, for a moment, please, uh, if you are six or eight, that's not a crucial problem. Maybe we can work in that uh, in that area as well. So, if you are one person or two people too many or less, doesn't make a difference. So please. Uh, uh, refrain from seven as a concrete number. We've got two questions uh, to be answered. Uh, I will give you, uh, when you start talking, I will give you papers to write the answers down and pens. Uh, we heard about some examples of uh, impact assessment studies from a uh, few, uh, few countries. What we would like to have at the end of this session is a um, a list of good examples that you know uh, from what you've seen in your associations, from what you've seen in your regions, what, you, what from you, uh, from what you've seen around the world, be it very specific studies or be it very small things. We are not talking about impact assessment on national level only or on world level only. Impact assessment can and should be happening from a petrol level to everywhere where there are more and more people. So. Any good examples, any good techniques, any good experience uh, when it gets shared will be very helpful. So that's, that's the first question. And the second one is what should world scouting do? Uh, we might come up with tools Wasn't might be developing. We might come up uh, with, some, uh, with some urgent calls to NSOs that they should behave in this and this way we might come up with something that tell them that we need a very low cost tools because the examples we have seen from the US and from the UK are very relevant but many associations probably will not have uh, so enough sources to make uh, a similar research so anything that you feel that WASM uh, could do that would benefit the world scouting on any level around the world is very helpful so you will get two papers, each, uh, each of the group. It's up to you whether you divide the discussion, whether you first discuss the first question and then the second, or whether you mix the questions together. It's, it's up to you. But those questions are to be, to be answered. And we do have 15 minutes for the discussion. Other questions? Uh, I mean, is it clear? Yeah, uh, no, not an answer. To, yeah, it's clear. So very good. So let's go. Nothing, nothing like being on the world stage, is there? Look, I'll, I'll just introduce myself first and maybe we can go around and just to understand what uh, everyone's responsibilities are. Um, my name's Martin Thomas. Um, I'm the National Chief Executive of Scouts Australia. So I'm just newly to the role. I've been in the job eight weeks, but I have actually worked at, uh, for scouting in two other states of Australia as executive manager. So I've sort of worked my way through the organisation and the concept of measurement and actually what we're achieving is absolutely a relevant topic for us because we've just renewed our strategic plan and a large part of that strategic plan is based on how we measure ourselves uh, in an attempt to present our story to the community of Australia. Yeah, I'm Alif Wang, I'm from Taiwan. You can go without the mic.
So, uh, excuse me, we've got uh, the last, last two minutes for the discussion and what I would like to ask you to do after the discussion was to be able for one of your group uh, to share one or two or three suggestions for WASM, what WASM should be doing in this area and uh, one example of a good practice that you came across in your discussion. So, two more minutes for this. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, I can be heard. So, uh, please let's return uh, to the front of the room. And if that's okay, if from every group one person can come up and uh, come over here to the front and sit in the front so that they can then exchange quickly in the front and uh, present the outcomes of the group. Just sit down for, uh, we'll start over here, very good. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So, very good, we almost have as many people sitting front here as we had groups. Uh, putting stress on the word almost, very good. So, do we have a speaker for each of the groups? It will probably develop, we have got seven speakers in the last group, I can see. Uh, so, we'll be starting with presenting the outcomes, so everybody wants to be very 
very much listening at the moment because these ideas will be brilliant. And uh, I will just repeat once again what we would like to hear uh, now are a few suggestions for world scouting to do, one, two, or three, not more than that, in a very short way. And then uh, maybe one example of a good practice that you came across in your discussions in your group. And there we start. Uh, my name is Moses, so I'll go on quick. Um, what should WOSM do? Uh, one of the first things we thought that it's important uh, to develop a standardized uh, framework for measuring the impact of scouting, uh, which will be able to guide on the process. Uh, secondly, uh, WOSM should be able to prepare uh, standard impact assessment tools so that any NSO can be able to pick that and start to measure. And then finally, that the focus uh, of our impact assessment should not only be on membership or rather the market share we have, but also on the change that we are having on, on society because that is what will make us relevant and probably make us even sell more. Uh, the other thing is that uh, all the good practices were related to membership, census, and uh, we felt that at the level of actually having an impact assessment on scouting, uh, it has not been measured. So that is it. Thank, thank you, Moses. Thank you very much. So thank you to Moses and his group. Uh, Claude, would you like to be the next one? I can hold that for you. Oh, that would be nice. We had a, f a few examples. Um, um, one was uh, Portugal, where the membership system um, is not just good for registering, but also allows to collect enough data to be able to perform um, the measurements needed later on. So this is also one of our demands, to go even further, as was um, in helping NSOs to put up the right um, membership recording, because only with the right data we will be able to, to do analysis and often it's the data that is missing, or we have different data um, depending on the country. Um, we were also talking about European Year of Volunteering, where a lot of NSOs in Europe um, tried to calculate the hours of volunteering spent by scouting and then translated it into different types of job with different types of salary, and this gave us an amount uh, of money that we could put, put forward to our national governments, but also uh, to the society uh, in general. Um, we also said we should not just crunch the numbers, um, it's about telling the story. Um, so we had one example of um, inviting external politicians, churches, uh, other organizations and talk to them and uh, get their view on scouting. Apparently in Portugal it was done and it was very interesting to see what they think of scouting and how positive they think the, our impact is. Um, so that's something we should also do. Um, we should share survey results um, between uh, different NSOs on the platform, but not just the results, also the uh, methodology that was used, so that we can apply common methodologies uh, between different uh, surveys. Um, we were a bit scared of um, analysis that only take top performers, uh, scout performers, like taking Eagle Scouts only and then comparing it to uh, a basis. Uh, this is a bias. Um, we should always take the whole uh, numbers. And then there were a few other examples, uh, which I will not go into detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claude and his group. There you go. Shall I hold that for you? So let's say I'm representing the group over there uh, with a wide variety of nations. Um, I think the two first groups actually said or touched on what we also discussed. Uh, we would like WUSP to develop some kind of diagnostics tool that could be used by the NSOs, uh, perhaps in form of templates. We talked a bit about that asking the questions or perform, performing the surveys is not the hard part. The hard part is knowing what questions to ask to measure impact. Uh, so perhaps WUSP could develop some kind of standard templates that we could use uh, to know what questions to ask. Uh, and we would also like WUSP to find the good examples, uh, which 
uh, surveys have been performed, which research does exist already. Uh, what methodologies were used? Uh, what were the results? So that we, that we can be inspired by other NSOs also. Uh, and then we, we tried to find good examples. We didn't actually find any in our group. Um, not that measure impact anyway. Uh, we do have, all do a lot of research or surveys. Uh, we do a lot of service in Sweden, uh, but mainly focusing on our members and their attitudes and our internal questions, so to speak. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much to your group over there. So, another speaker for another group? Any outcomes? Very good. I mean, outcomes, outputs, or impacts? <laughs> Some of these? Wow, that's a lot. I hand them over to you. Um, so I were in the group at the far end of the plenary hall. And we had a lot of different um, views on how to measure outcome and what the aggregated outcome could be as impact. Uh, for example, the Girl Guides in the UK have measured that scouts in a higher rate than non-scouts are uh, paying more to philanthropy, to charity, and they are also doing more service hours in other NSOs, uh, not only in scouting, but in, in other non-governmental organizations than those who are not scouts. Uh, so that is one interesting topic to, to see. Um, in Australia, there was also a lot of uh, good work done measuring numbers of service hours and uh, comparing that to relating that yeah, to the cost of uh, the society if they were to pay for that service uh, instead. Um, and we were also addressing that Walsam could perhaps uh, develop some templates um, that we can use to help us. And uh, one of the other things was Walsam on a global level could assess and see how many influential, influential leaders there are in, for example, United Nations organs or uh, parliaments uh, on world level that have a history in scouting and compare that to the membership percentage uh, globally and see if scouting really develops um, citizens, world citizens. Um, and then the different regions could do the same within, for example, the European Parliament and see if the parliamentarians in a higher rate are scouts. Um, for example, yeah. So that was some examples. Thank you very much to the group at the back. Do we have another group or is this all? Okay, we've got one more. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this group over here, uh, we decided that um, there weren't many very good practices. <laughs> So, but there was a, something of interest that we did. Uh, we mentioned earlier that there was a perception, uh, the, the participation rate, the percentage of young people of their age group. Australia does do that, and uh, we're running it somewhere between one and uh, one and a half percent, depending on the age range. A little higher, perhaps, uh, in some states. But generally speaking, we can measure it, and we do measure it. But it doesn't actually tell how significant we are. Obviously, we were fifty percent. Uh, of the youth population, the government will sit up and take notice. But we're not nowhere near that. The other one that's important here though, in Australia we've been doing an external survey for a number of years. Every month a private uh, consultancy group, um, research group, go out and survey the Australian population for all sorts of things. You know, what toothpaste you eat, all those sorts of things. We have a couple of questions in that survey and uh, gives us the answer to how do you rate Scouts Australia, what do you think of Scouts, um, What's your perception of them? Um, what values do they? How they compare with the boy, with the uh, nippers? That is the uh, surf life saving young people. How they compare with the other youth clubs in Australia, the Air Force, Army cadets, etc. Well, Scouts does rank regularly and all the time number one against those other youth organisations. So the perception the perception is that Scouts ranks highly, and also values like um, Scouts has high integrity. Um, they train young people to be better leaders. The perception in Australia is that we're up around 90% in all of those things. So we have a high perception rate, but really, I don't know, that tells us what the impact is. 
It tells us what people perceive, but doesn't tell us exactly what it does. So that's useful, and we can make that available for anybody. But there were no other practices we could find that can give you some empirical data. What can WASM do? Well, we've got to go into collecting data, and uh, some of the other speakers have mentioned it. We need to know and use the key community leader type syndrome. We've used it occasionally, where we've said, you know, most American presidents have been a scout. I think all the um, astronauts except one have been Eagle Scouts. Not that the Eagle Scouts are important, the fact they were a scout is important. And we need to highlight that and brought that together because it's very useful for selling it to other people. The, um, we need to have uh, data on the diversity and uh, the key risk areas. For example, in Australia, doctors will send um, children with special needs to scouts because they know we're inclusive and we'll try to manage them. So normally the population in Australia might be one in ten young people has a disability or a special need, particularly asthma and uh, ADD and those types of uh, things. And we suspect we're probably up closer to 15 to 20 percent of our population has that type of problem. You only need to have a camp and you'll see just what happens. But we, we don't measure it because we don't record it. The Privacy Act doesn't allow us to ask that when they join. And so we don't know. So if you went to the government to seek help, that's very useful too. The fact that we're helping more and more of the disadvantaged people than what people give us credit for. So we need to collect that. The problem is in Australia, we don't have one membership system. We have about five because each branch has its own. We can't collect the data easily. And so uh, it's not easy to pull that together. But anyhow, we need to know what we can measure and how we should go about it and start a process in place so the next five years we can do that. So that's the lead we're asking from Osm. Thank you, Reg, and the group up front here. So we ran out of time five minutes ago, as you have definitely, surely most of you noticed. So we're cutting into your break already. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for the participation in the session. Uh, we, what we heard from you now, uh, the outcomes, you might have heard a lot of overlap when it comes to what we would like to see from the World Organization to do for the NS, uh, NSOs. There are things about collecting data, there are things about suggesting templates, there are things about uh, raising the right questions, and there are things about being able to compare data from one region to another so that uh, it can go transparently and that we base our questions on the same, on the same basis. Uh, we will uh, work uh, with the outcomes of this session and we will uh, provide it to, uh, to the team uh, that will provide that to, uh, to the leadership of WASN. By the way, we had the chairman of the World Scout Committee with us for about two minutes uh, earlier, so I think he heard some of the, some of the wishes uh, we might have. So thank you very much for participating uh, in this session. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. And thank you, everybody who was here and everybody who was asking questions uh, online. And we hope that uh, together with these outputs from these 90 minutes, um, I wasn't might get a little bit more insight in what we want uh, in individual NSOs and what good examples there are already around the scouting world. Uh, last but not least, I would like to ask you when you'll be leaving to fill out within two minutes the evaluation forms and put them in a box over there. Thank you very much and have a good last session of the Congress. Once you fill up the forms, could you please drop them in the mailbox on the way out and take one badge for not sleeping or snoring too loudly. Thank you. There's a mailbox at the uh, water cooler.